it's a pleasure for us to be here. So I am Robert, this is Stephanie. We are Uncorked Wine Events here in Zurich. And we, uh, we're Americans, we came to Zurich almost nine years ago uh, for corporate jobs like normal people. And then somehow, uh, accidentally, we started uh, a wine business about three or four years ago. Uh, started as a hobby, teaching some of our friends about wine and food, which is something we're very passionate about. And then, like I said, kind of accidentally turned into a business. Uh, but we're, um, we're very much into uh, wine and food pairing. And our business now, uh, we started teaching wine classes, but now we do a lot of events. So birthday parties, private events, uh, a lot of team building, corporate events, but anything that has to do with fun and food and wine, that's what Uncorked does. So today, uh, so the good news is, if you're tired after a long day of learning, uh, the good news is actually your weekend isn't over yet because we have wine that needs to be drunk and we have this uh, selection of cheeses in front of you. So the, the topic that we chose uh, for this uh, presentation is there's this sense that people have that somehow wine and cheese uh, pairing or these two things should, should somehow magically uh, make each other uh, better, so to speak, or there's some, uh, there's some secret connection between these two, what we call fermented wonders of the world. And the truth is that uh, actually, if you've ever, uh, I don't know, gone to the grocery store and just tried to pick a wine and tried to pick a cheese and think, okay, maybe these things will, will complement each other, these are, without exaggerating, two of the most complicated product categories in the world. You have all different variations coming from all different countries in different languages. The products actually change every year because of the weather and the vintages. Uh, and both of those things are true for both wine and cheese. So we like to take these complicated subjects and really simplify them. So today we have wines that you can find. We always like to use the, uh, the co-op and, uh, and Migro uh, example. So these are cheeses, with the exception of one that you can find at uh, at Co-op and Migro, and these are all wine names that once you've learned them today, they're never hard to find again. You can find them in Denner, you can find them in uh, Co-op or or Move and Pick or places like that. The only exception is the cheese at the at the end, the the final one. You need to go to either Yelmoli or Globus. So. Uh, but still uh, totally available. Okay, so the whole idea of the, we're, we're really going to actually uh, exercise your taste a little bit. So as we're drinking and eating, we'll make you think a little bit about what you're actually tasting. So, uh, which is not something we normally do day to day. Of course, we, we eat and we drink uh, every day, but you never really stop and think about what's going on. And if you've had something that's particularly delicious, you may not stop to think, wow, you know, what was it in that special restaurant or what was it about uh, that experience that was so wonderful? So we'll talk you through actually the, the art and the science of doing that. And in order to do that, we'll talk just a little bit about how to taste wine kind of officially, professionally, but nothing too serious. And the, the, uh, the idea, like I said again, is that this is something that you can, if you enjoy it, something to really, uh, uh, something that's easy to uh, reproduce for yourself or your friends at home, okay? And these pairings, I would say, almost never fail. So these are really some of the absolute classics uh, in the world, okay? So first, if you think about your head and food and wine, there are kind of two things uh, going on. So lit literally the word taste has to do with what goes on on your taste buds on your tongue. So you are, your tongue is sensitive to uh, sweet taste or uh, acidity, which you think of as sour, or also uh, salty. And then uh, bitterness is another one that you find in some wines. And then finally, you've got this fifth uh, taste, which is umami, which is kind of a savoriness, uh, which we may not talk much about. But this is basically what you can experience on your tongue. Then with your nose, you've got, uh, you've got aromas. And what you think of as flavor, so what you think of as a fruit or a flower, or if you've got a blue cheese, if it's particularly um, biting or something like that, what you think of as of flavors is actually some complex combination of what your nose is doing and what your tongue is doing. So we'll separate those things as we go. 
the other important thing when it comes to food and wine that you don't really think about too much, but there's a, a texture or a weight on your tongue. So you can think about um, if the cheese is creamy or if it's uh, quite firm. You can think about if the wine is, is light on your tongue or quite heavy. Then this is also something that, that gives you, well, it's part of the sensory experience, okay? So it's easier to do it than it is to talk about it. So we'll start here uh, in just a moment. The first introduction, the most important thing you need to know if you want to think about a wine is you read a lot of uh, wine poetry is what we call it. So you read all these beautiful descriptions of fruits and flowers and you're smelling the wine and some of the descriptions, I think a lot of them are quite ridiculous and you're wondering, can that person really smell all of those crazy things in the glass? And okay, maybe they can because they've been trained, but normal people really can't do that. So the m the more what you're experiencing when you've had a, a wine, if you like it or you don't like it, is some combination of uh, the official terms are body and then acidity. So the body is what I was just referring to. It's the, the weight of a liquid on your tongue. And some liquids are naturally light bodied, meaning they're kind of thin, and some are more full bodied. And the, the best easiest example that works, particularly in Switzerland, is if you think about milk. So if you have a, a mager milk or a, a skim milk with basically no fat, if you kind of swish it around your mouth a little bit before you swallow, it's quite thin. It feels like water on your tongue. Some people don't like it on their muesli in the morning because it just, it doesn't seem like it has much substance, but it still tastes like milk. But on the other hand, if you take something like a full milk or a cream, it, the taste, I mean, which the flavor is essentially the same, but the texture of it, the experience of it is totally different on your tongue. And this is true with wines as well. So some wines are more what you would call light body and some are more full body and some are in the middle. So we'll talk about that. And that is a characteristic that with food, if you have a good wine and food pairing, the body of the wine will actually change. So we'll see that in just a moment, that you'll think, I tasted this wine, it seems a little thin. After the cheese, it actually seems like it brings more body into the wine and it tastes better. Then the other thing uh, that you can think about, so there's the cow example. Uh, the other thing you can think about is, uh, or the other thing that's important to think about is acidity. Which, I which you find in all fruit juices. So it's, it's something that, uh, it's the characteristic, it's acid or kind of this sour um, uh, perception that keeps fruit juices very light and fresh. So you can think of something like lemon juice or something like orange juice or something like wine, which uh, has kind of a bright freshness to it. And so the combination of body and acidity then, different wine grapes all over the world, uh, they have different kind of expected or natural levels of body and acidity. And it can change depending on the weather, depending on the, the country and, and the winemaker. But essentially you can always expect within a certain range that a wine will have a certain combination, okay? So we'll taste that here with this, this first example is one of our favorites uh, of all time. So you have probably heard these words. It's a great French uh, term, right? Sauvignon Blanc. It's fun to say even like that. Um, so Sauvignon Blanc, you can see this. This grape is grown all over the world. It's from France originally, but it actually I should say that is a grape name. So if you've seen that on bottles, so the next time you go to dinner or co-op or wherever, if you see this on a bottle and it's quite common, now you know that's a grape, okay? And they make it in France. Its original home or kind of its most famous home, I should say, in France is uh, from a village called Sancerre, which is up in the northern part uh, in the Loire Valley. So you can also see the word Sancerre on a wine label, and that's French code, so to speak. That's a village name, and that village is famous for its 100% Sauvignon Blanc wines. And that style then, or that grape, uh, traveled around the world, and you can still, uh, of course, you still find it by that name. Okay, so that's the wine that you have in your glass right now. So we'll use this our, as our first example of, we'll do a quick little taste, and then you'll have the first cheese on your plate. We'll be moving from left to right with the cheeses, and then uh, you'll see how the taste changes. So 
the first thing about Sauvignon Blanc, which is kind of fun, is if you want to look like you really know what you're doing, you can swirl your glass. You see wine people swirling their glasses all the time. So you can start uh, with small circles on the table. If you feel more confident, you can bring it up into the air without splashing your neighbor, hopefully. And the idea of swirling is you're bringing up, so it looks cool, right? You look like you know what you're doing. You think, okay, I, I'm a wine person. But uh, the, the real idea is it's functional, which means that you're bringing the wine up in a narrow layer on the side of the glass, which allows uh, the wine to evaporate more easily. So you're actually putting more aromatic compounds into the glass. And then every good wine glass should be thicker at the bottom and narrower at the top. So that actually allows you to swirl. And the other thing is it concentrates the aromas at the top. So if you swirl, and then you just dive right in with your whole face. So don't swirl and then kind of hold the glass down here and sniff and wonder, oh, did I smell anything? You have to swirl, generate all this really good aroma, and then you dive right in with your nose, take a few sniffs. And Sauvignon Blanc is fun because it's the most common, uh, famous, aromatic grape in the world. So usually when you have one of these wines, you really get some kind of bright aroma. Okay, so you can start there. Then... If you will, I'll talk you through uh, the, the abbreviated version of the professional uh, wine tasting method. Okay, so you're going to take the glass there. You can give it a swirl and a sniff. And then when you taste, you'll take about 15 milliliters, which is about a tablespoon or about a medium mouthful. So just kind of a normal uh, mouthful. Then you don't want to swallow it right away. Uh, we drink and swallow a lot of wine. You don't always have to evaluate it, but if you're really evaluating it, you should swish it around on your tongue for a few seconds, three, four, five seconds, something like that. So you can think about these characteristics that I just mentioned. So while it's on your tongue, you can think about the body. So is it really thin like, like water or like skim milk? Does it really seem to splash around a lot and fall to the bottom of your, of your palate? That would be a, a light-bodied wine. Or is it really thick, really heavy, like, uh, like cream or full milk? Does it really you know, have quite some presence on your tongue? I'll, I'll tell you because you don't have anything to compare it to. Sauvignon Blanc is a medium-bodied wine. So it should be somewhere between skim milk and full milk. It should feel kind of medium heavy on your tongue. Then the other thing you want to think about uh, while you're swishing is you make sure you, you uh, the reason you do that is you want to get the wine on the both the front and the middle and the back and the side uh, part of your tongue because your uh, taste buds that are more receptive for these different tastes on different parts of your tongue. And the most important one is on the sides and the back is where you're the most uh, sensitive to acidity. And when you drink an acidic liquid, the reaction of your mouth after you swallow is your mouth actually waters. So an acidic beverage is actually mouth watering. And uh, some people are more sensitive to it to others, but it's a natural and it's actually a good thing. You find it a lot in aperitif style wines. So we have a dog at home and when her mouth waters, we know what she wants. She wants to eat. And we've also learned that people are not so different. So when you have an acidic wine or an acidic liquid, also like you can think of sparkling wines like champagne are, are many times also in this style. So if you have one of these light wines or Pinot Grigio would be another Italian grape in this style. It, if you think about it, it's making your mouth water. You're supposed to be having it at the beginning of the meal and suddenly, oh, there's some olives here or there's some salami here or look, there's some, mi you know, some uh, mild cheese here and it makes you want to start eating. You've got a little antipasti uh, platter if you're lucky. So the whole idea of these wines, if you drink them, you think, ah, not much flavor. They're not supposed to have a lot of flavor. They're supposed to be getting your mouth going, makes you want to eat, makes you want to drink, repeat, and suddenly you're having a great time. So. Sauvignon Blanc is uh, a medium bodied, but uh, also typically a very acidic grape. So if you do that taste test, again, take in about uh, a tablespoon or so, swish it around, think about uh, how much it weighs on your tongue, make sure when you swish you get it on the sides and the back, and when you swallow, notice that your mouth is suddenly, suddenly watering. Okay. Now, you may decide that you like this wine style or you don't. I don't know if you do or not. This is a classic. Uh, this is actually the wine you're drinking is a Sancerre. It's from the town of Sancerre. So it's the classic French version. And a lot of French wines are built for food, meaning that it improves with food. So here's your first 
a uh, really, really classic uh, combination uh, wine and cheese. So the, the cheese on the far left of your plate is a fresh goat cheese. You can get it at, at Migro or, or Co-op. It's, it's fresh, it's simple. Um, what we want you to do is, we have a, the instructions are wine, food, wine. So easy to remember. But the idea is take a, another sip of your wine, remind yourself of the body, swish it around, remind yourself of the acidity that is making your mouth water, then have a good old big bite of goat cheese, and then kind of move that around your mouth a little bit, get that flavor around your mouth. Then when you swallow, uh, when you're ready, then you take another sip of wine. And hopefully what you'll notice, the, the differences are not night and day, but if you do wine, food, wine, you should notice that all of a sudden, the body of the wine seems to be heavier. It actually seems like there's more body and more fruit flavor in the wine than before. The acidity, if you didn't like really that kind of that sharp, acidic, uh, mouth-watering watering characteristic, the acidity of the wine after the cheese actually seems to come down. And so, and the cheese itself, if you have a fresh goat cheese like this, it's quite thick, it's quite chalky. If you have just a few bites of cheese, it can also start to overwhelm your palate. But the relative medium body and high acidity of the wine, they also kind of wash the cheese off your palate. So if that's a lot to explain, hopefully it's easier to just sense it, but hopefully what you experience is that both the wine and the cheese somehow taste better after you've put this combination together. True? Yeah? Okay? Yeah? Good? All right, good. This is a classic. I mean, if this one doesn't work, then, then we're in big trouble because this is, and so this is also a really a, a common characteristic of, I would say, most often uh, French wine and Italian wine. So this is not a culture, I mean, they've been making wine for so long that they're not thinking about sitting on the couch, watching TV, drinking wine, because this isn't, is it, this isn't the history of it. They're thinking always when they're making and then drinking wine, they're thinking about what food do I have in front of me. So the next time you travel around Europe in general, but particularly in France or Italy, the absolute best rule of thumb is order the local wine, ask for, or if you know it, whatever the local dish is. And typically when you do wine, food, wine, with a local wine and a local food, the wine will change for the better. So it's, a, it's, it's your new uh, vacation exercise. Next time you're on holiday, this is your homework assignment, you can report back. But typically, in those two countries in particular, uh, these two things are meant to complement each other. Okay? Good. So that's a lot of information, and then there's less information as we go in more practice. But let me just pause right there, and the other thing is, you can probably tell, we're very casual style in all of our classes and, and everything we do. So if there's any questions about what I'm talking about right now or just some burning question that you have about wine that nobody ever answered, uh, absolutely just speak up, raise your hand. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, okay. People, uh, you want to look for an easy rule of thumb and the the, and that's, I would actually say, a myth or a misconception that people think because the cheese can be relatively strong and red wines are typically stronger than white wines. And so the natural thought is I pair something strong with something strong. But I would say if I, have to, if I had to give another piece of advice, that's actually completely the wrong direction. So the better way to go with cheese or food in general is either the wine or the food needs to be the star. So one of them needs to be more powerful and the other one needs to be the co-star and kind of sit in the background. If you get two powerful characters and you put them together, they typically try to fight. So, um, so actually, I mean, if I had to give you the easiest rule of thumb that I can, there's a, there's a white grape called Gewürztraminer, if you know that name. The, if I had to pick, it's very difficult because, I mean, if you get a cheese plate, you have four or five different, right? And they go everything like on your plate here from light to medium to blue and stinky and everything. And so it's really hard to find one wine that matches. But that grape, Gewürztraminer, is the best one, which is a white grape. If I had to just throw one out, is th has the best chance of matching to a wide range of cheeses. So, but, but honestly, not many people give that advice. So, yeah. Okay? Yeah. I'm sorry? Ah, and the, okay, yeah, the wine, white wines are more acidic, and that also helps sometimes with the cheeses, yeah. Yeah. 
Ah, uh, yes, true. Exactly. Exactly. Gew exactly. Gewurztraminer is, um, is, is also a fairly strong character. The, the nice thing and the reason it works with cheeses and with spicy food is it's a very sugary grape. And when it makes a wine, it's, it, it usually makes a slightly sweet wine. And sweet, as we learned, right, is an important one of the important taste characteristics. So sweet and spicy is a fantastic combination. And if you get a blue cheese, I mean, it's blue, it's stinky, but even then you can sometimes have this kind of biting sharpness. And the sweet characteristic of Gewürztraminer also uh, can kind of um, moderate the, uh, those strong, the strong blue cheese like that. Yeah. Absolutely. We talk about that in our wine classes, which sometimes if you have a full-bodied wine that has a lot of fruit flavor, people think that it means that it's sweet. There's actually a good example. The next grape that we'll pour, the next wine that we'll pour is Chardonnay. And Chardonnay is naturally more full-bodied and naturally fruitier, we would call it. It has more rich, powerful fruit flavor than uh, Sauvignon Blanc. And so if you drink Chardonnay and you think, ah, that it's too sweet for me because you don't have any other vocabulary word. The, m the more official technical wine word would be uh, it's, it's too fruity or it's too much fruit flavor if you don't like that style of wine. So if I'm your sommelier and you say, I don't like sweet wine, I know what you mean. I, I know, I mean, I could, we if we're in a restaurant, right, I'm not going to challenge you, but I would say, yeah, okay, I know what he or she means is they don't like really heavy, fruity wines, so we would give you something more like uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, so there are, so it's just, yeah, it's just, there are some key words that we're talking about them today, that even if you use these a little bit, wine people get very, very excited. So if you start saying anything, if you say the word body or the word acidity or, as or both of them in the same sentence in a restaurant or in a wine store, watch that person's eyes just light up. And I mean, it happens a lot. We get, you'll start getting free samples, like in restaurants. They'll say, oh, well, if you know body and acidity, then here, try this one and see if you like this one and try that one. And then in wine stores too, they just, they go crazy because you're talking their language. It's just, it's just learning, it's like learning any language. And as soon as you connect on that level, the other person suddenly also wants to communicate. So um, it's a great question. And yes, so these kinds of vocabulary words, body and acid and fruit flavor are better than simpler words like sweet or dry, something like that. Okay, great questions. Anybody else? Should we keep going? Sorry? Keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. There's the fresh goat cheese. Okay, so the next grape is, uh, this is the most grown grape around the world. So again, you'll see this uh, on, on wine labels and wine menus everywhere you go around the world. And if you didn't, if you didn't know, uh, Chardonnay is also a grape name. So typically in the wine world, if, if there's names that you see a lot, they're most often grape names, but many times in Europe, they're, uh, they're location names. And starting to figure out the world of wine then is simply knowing in which cases it's a grape and, in, and the characteristics of the grape, and in which cases it's a, uh, it's a town. And if it's a town, then you just have to know which grape they're famous for in that town. So uh, it's one extra step. Okay, so Chardonnay is, the characteristic of this grape is it's much more medium or full bodied. So, y so when you taste this one, you can think about how much it weighs on your tongue. And like the good question here, it's got more fruit flavor. So whereas the first one uh, was not as flavorful, this one is, Chardonnay is really known for being a pretty uh, powerful character. So it's got more rich kind of ripe tropical flavor, like a mango or a pineapple or a banana, something like that. And it also then many times is aged in oak. You hear a lot about oak, er, uh, oak barrel aging with wines, and that is essentially like a, like a condiment, like a mustard or a ketchup or something like that. Oak is this condiment that winemakers can choose to put into, uh, into different wines. And Chardonnay, because it is a more powerful character, it takes more of this condiment than a lot of other grapes. So those are non-fruit flavors, and some people love them, and some people don't like them so much. But if you smell or taste something that's more kind of buttery or caramel, or many times this one reminds me of buttered popcorn, so you've got, uh, or else you can get kind of a toasty uh, aspect, like toast, literally toasted bread. It, it kind of smells like that. Uh, so you get all these other notes 
uh, which are added on to the flavor of the wine, which give it even more character. Okay, so for a wine like this, then uh, it also needs a, a fairly stronger cheese. So if you have any goat cheese left and you want a pairing that's not so great, you can try Chardonnay and goat cheese. Okay, this is not a classic and they don't really go well together, but I if no one ever told you, you may think, well, I'll just take this bottle and I'll take this cheese and try it. It doesn't really work so well. So what you need here is actually cheeses that have a little bit more like the wine, a little bit more age and a little bit more substance. So you've got two on your plate in the next uh, position over. The one on the top is the famous Swiss Gruyere, and the one uh, beneath that is the even more famous English Cheddar. And these are both, uh, they're both cow milk cheeses, they're both uh, relatively salty, and they're both relatively long aged. So they've also developed, well you'll notice the texture is very different than the fresh goat cheese. So they're much more medium textured, and the flavor is, is more pronounced. They're quite savory, if we use that word, and they're also a little bit more, um, the, the, the characteristic is you get some nuttiness like a roasted nut or something like that. So they're, they're definitely more complex than the goat. And the idea here is that if you again try wine food wine, this is a different kind of, this is more of a flavor pairing, whereas the first one was a taste pairing. So in the first uh, Sauvignon Blanc example, you had the acidity in the body were seeming to change. In this pairing, it's more that you've got these really nice flavors from the Chardonnay, and they, the body of the cheese matches, and they just do this nice little dance, so to speak, with the relatively mature, nutty uh, flavors of the cheeses. And both of these typically work really pretty well. Um, but again, you can try uh, wine food wine with, with both of those and with the Chardonnay. Again, you, when you swish it around for a few seconds, if you wanna think about the body, it should feel heavier, it should feel more kind of powerful. So something closer to uh, 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 full milk on your, on your palate. And also when you swish and swallow, it shouldn't make your mouth water quite as much. So as a, uh, as a grape, it's not as acidic as the Sauvignon Blanc. Okay, so, so those things, so the way I would describe the second pairing is, those things don't change so much on your tongue the way they did uh, in the first pairing, but the flavors marry very nicely together. Is that happening? Am I making it up? It's happening, I get some yeses. Okay, good, yeah, yeah. So the idea is, again with these things, that, that one of the two characters is that they play nicely together, so to speak, and that somehow the experience is better with the two together than it is with either of them on their own, okay? And then you can decide, it depends on your mood and the weather, you can decide whether you think the pairing would be better with the Gruyere or the Cheddar but they both typically work uh, pretty nicely. And that's a, that's a Mittelreif, so the, the medium level of uh, maturity and spiciness on the Gruyere. They have the, the Mild, the Mittelreif, and then the, what do they call it, Picant, I think, the, the stronger, spicier one. Yeah, and that has to do with how long they've aged the cheese, and the longer they age it, the more, the more bite it has. And we've done this, this testing at home, and we like the one in the middle, but you can also experiment around, okay? So any other thoughts or questions? But th the other important thing to note is you've now just tasted the two most popular worldwide grapes. Everywhere you go, you will find Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay, and they will more or less be similar to what you just had, so. Ah, yeah. Um, I think the best example for me is always the Italian antipasti platter, and they have a lot of really light uh, aperitif style white wines, like the Pinot Grigio is the one that people know that name, and it's an easy style to find. And yes, so the, with these aperitif pairings, so you want kind of a mild cheese, but the, the better pairings are uh, olives and salami, and or if you have these little, um, cheese straws. So what you're looking for is in your, in your uh, aperitif food that if the food is quite salty, 
or it's quite rich, or it's quite creamy, or if you think about a salami, it's quite oily. So if you have a few bites, or the, the olives also have um, quite, a, quite a bite to them, yeah? So if you have a few bites of the same thing, those, those flavors and tastes start to overwhelm your palate. And the whole idea of the Pinot Grigio is, again, it's light body and it's high in acid, and it almost cleans your tongue. So you eat a few pieces of salami, it's getting a little heavy, you have that wine, and all of a sudden, it kind of cleans everything away, and also, um, Another good rule of thumb, so is f acidity in food, like olives, for instance, it actually likes acidity in wine. And you would think it would just overwhelm your tongue, and instead you see more like what we had in the first pairing, which is somehow the acidity magically seems to disappear, but it brings more flavor out. So that's your next homework assignment. You probably didn't think you would have a lot to do after this, this class, but you have a lot of homework assignments. So the other one is order a Pinot Grigio, and an Italian antipasti platter and try some of those combinations. And again, you know, these are things you eat and enjoy and don't think about much every day. But if you stop and think about why they seem to be so good together, these are some of the reasons why. So, okay, good, we keep going. Good, all right. So now, speaking of Italy, we, so we had two white wines and then we've got two red wines. All right, so another uh, really classic pairing here. And this one is, so not many people know this grape name. So the famous grape of the Tuscany region in the central part of Italy, uh, the grape name is Sangiovese, but the region name is much more famous, it's Chianti. So, and, and really most places that you go in Tuscany, they're using this, this grape, uh, classic Italian grape, in some form or another. So the wine that's being poured is really a classic uh, a Chianti Classico. It's part of the, the legal uh, definition of, of how they label it. But the grape is called Sangiovese. So if you visited Tuscany, you probably loved the food, loved the wine, everything about it was gorgeous, which is true. It's, it's a fantastic area. But when you have these wines and you're not on holiday and you're in Zurich and you're not in Tuscany any anymore, when you try the wine, it actually has a different character than maybe what you expect or what you think about. So this is also a food wine. And for a red wine, if you try it, again, thinking about the body and the acidity, it's for a red wine, it's quite relatively light bodied. It feels pretty thin on your palate actually. And if you really give it that swish and swallow, it also really makes your, your mouth water. So in a way, it's got characteristics that you would expect almost more from a white wine. And the other thing you have to look out for in red wines is in the, the skin of the grape, there's a compound called tannin. And it's the, it's the compound that then uh, soaks into the wine and it makes your mouth feel like sandpaper. So, you know, some wines are make your mouth feel really dry. Again, the word people use is dry because it seems to be drying out your mouth. So that's officially incorrect. The word you're looking for is tannin. And then you can say, okay, also another word that will light up the eyes of somebody in a wine store, you can say I'd like a red wine with little to no tannin or medium tannin or heavy tannin. And that is describing then how much of this sandpapery kind of dry uh, feeling you're getting on your tongue. It's the same feeling you have if you oversteep black tea. There's also tannin in tea leaves. And if you forget and leave your tea too long and you taste it, it really, it dries out your mouth in the same way. Or, th or the other one is, mm. yeah, that puckering, yeah, exactly. So when you try the wine without the cheese, you can think like, usually the, the, the reaction is, wow, that wouldn't be my first choice of a red wine to drink. It's relatively light body, it, it makes your mouth water if you swish it around, and it dries out your mouth. So these are, if they're not so pleasant on their own, these are fantastically good food pairing characteristics. So this time we're going to look again for what happened with the Sauvignon Blanc, which is you've, if you try wine, food, wine, so remind yourself of the characteristics of the Chianti. Then you have the classic cheese in the middle, which is the Parmigiano Reggiano, which is also a very salty, very long aged, kind of characterful uh, cheese. And in this case, you try the wine, you, the cheese is also quite rich, so you kind of have to work that around your mouth and get the flavor all around your mouth. Swallow, then when you have the wine again, you should notice that the wine hopefully seems much, much better. So the, the big thing you should notice is that the tannin should hopefully seem to almost disappear. 
so it nearly goes away. So make sure you really kind of work the cheese around and get the flavors around your mouth. The other thing is, if you don't like that sharp acidity, the acidity seems to have gone down a lot, and hopefully, like the Sauvignon Blanc, it seems like the, the wine has more body and more flavor. So hopefully with this pairing, again, almost everything that maybe you didn't like so much about the wine to begin has changed for the better after you get a good bite of the uh, Parmesan. Is that happening? Yes, I see a few nods. Eh, I see a so-so, yeah, yeah. I see a few yeses. The, the big thing that should, the big thing that hopefully you would notice is if you had that tannic, that sandpapery effect in the beginning, that after the cheese, at the very least, that seems to, to go way down. And that alone for many people makes the wine more enjoyable. And then, yeah. And then the, the other changes are usually a little bit more subtle. But, um, but the idea, again, with this wine is you can, you can try this pairing just like this at home or if you're in an Italian restaurant and you order a Chianti wine, this is the perfect combination with uh, a pasta dish. So you've got the pasta is also kind of medium bodied. It's not really heavy like a steak or something. It's usually got a fresh uh, tomato sauce, which is acidic, which then kind of marries very well with the acidity in the wine. And when the waiter or waitress comes over with the block of Parmigiano and starts to ask if they can grate it over to the top of your plate, you don't be polite and after two seconds, you know, say, okay, I'm done. The whole idea is the more of that Parmesan that you load on that pasta, hopefully the more and more positive effect you're going to have with this relatively light-bodied wine. So again, there's, a, there's a, an art and a science to why these foods and wines uh, many times appear together. Okay, good. So uh, that's number three. There's a picture of the Parmigiano comes in these, these really large uh, aged wheels. And then uh, finally, okay, so here this one looks like science. So it's not that complicated, but it's another all-time classic. So we move for the fourth and final pairing. There's this scary category of blue cheese. So some people love it, and some people are really afraid by it and just run in the other direction. So you've got a whole family of essentially it's different um, bacterias that are... Um, uh, introduced into the cheese during the cheese making process and then there's typically also some relatively long aging in a cellar but you've got examples like uh, Roquefort is the famous uh, really strong blue cheese from France or you've got uh, Gorgonzola comes from the northern part of Italy is softer creamier but also has this really strong kind of sharp earthy spicy blue flavor and uh, the last sample or the sample that we have for you here on your plate is the famous blue, uh, again from England, which is Stilton. So it is, and it, whereas those other two I just mentioned, the Roquefort and the Gorgonzola, they're a little bit creamier in texture. Uh, the, the Stilton is a bit more like a cheddar or like a Gruyere. It's got quite a, quite a medium texture, but also some good strong blue flavor. So when you get a really strong cheese like this, the best thing to pair with it, like was already mentioned, is sweetness in wine. And so we mentioned uh, the one grape that typically is a little bit sweet, uh, and the white side is the Gewürztraminer. In the red wine world, uh, the category of port is by definition also uh, a quite sweet uh, red wine. So quickly, uh, how they make, how, how you make red wine in general, but how you make port is once the, the grapes are harvested and then they'll crush the grapes to release the, the grape juice. So the grape juice is sweet, just like grape juice that you would buy in the store. So they typically then put that into a tank and they'll introduce yeast and the yeast will start fermentation. So fermentation is simply the natural process of yeast eating sugar and turning it into alcohol. So that's how all alcohol is made. All alcohol is made with, it starts with some sweet liquid, could be grapes, could be from corn, could be from cactus. You start with some sweet liquid, you add yeast, the yeast turns the sugar into alcohol, and then you go from there. Okay, so with port, it's a special process that they, they, they make in the, uh, the Douro Valley in Portugal. They actually, at the uh, near the beginning of this fermentation process. So you've got a lot of natural grape sugar and it's starting to turn into alcohol. And at some point, they add a good uh, dose of brandy. So brandy is 40% is, um, uh, degrees, 40% alcohol. So that 
kills the yeast. The yeast can't live in that uh, much alcohol. And so basically they stop the fermentation. So now you've got a certain amount of grape, natural grape sugar, which is left. And then you've got a certain amount of alcohol that was created and was also added. So the style of port is naturally sweet and naturally, well, naturally, about normally about 20% alcohol. So it's quite strong as well. So this final pairing is a bit of an exception where you're taking quite a strong character with the cheese and you're matching it with quite a strong uh, wine character as well. Okay, but this one is another, um, uh, this one is another, uh, I would say more of a flavor combination. So again, the, um, neither one of these, well, what should I say? The, the, the strength of the two should, should balance themselves to a fair amount, but again, you should get somehow a nice uh, flavor combination uh, that these, these flavors, um, that the wine and the cheese make each other more interesting after you've had the two together. And the, the, the uh, relatively strong blue character of the Stilton is masked or kind of moderated nicely by the, the sweetness in the wine. If you want an extra uh, helping, you may end up with a headache Monday morning. But uh, anyway, it might be worth it. This is a... This is another really, really big uh, classic. And then the other thing, just to throw it in because chocolate is always good, another really fantastic uh, pairing with port in general is a, a dark chocolate. And many times as, as dark as you can possibly get it. So you're looking for a really relatively high level of cocoa. So that means that not much sugar has been, has been added. And also then you're looking for, I mean these dark chocolates also have a bitter character. And this is another one of these taste combinations where you've got something, the chocolate, which is quite strong and quite bitter, but you have a wine, which is quite strong and quite sweet. And you've got the fruit, the red fruit flavors of the wine and the dark chocolate are again, just making this kind of magic combination, hopefully. So those are, those are another two, uh, two uh, combinations to look out for. The Stilton, like I said, you have to go to uh, Yelmoli or Globus. They both carry Stilton, but at least uh, the the co-op and the Migro near us uh, do not, but but if you like that combination, then uh, and there's and then the the other uh, I shouldn't even mention it, but then you've got the, uh, port, which is a complicated category. You can see tawny ports. You maybe have heard that term, or you can see ruby ports, um, and this these combinations work with, I would say in general, it works well with all different kinds of ports. So if you want to talk about that, I won't talk about it right now. Come ask me later. We'll talk all about the different styles of port. It has to do with the age, essentially. A ruby isn't aged as long as a tawny, so they, they change character. Okay? All right. So hopefully we stayed close to 45 minutes. So, so if these worked for you, these are all really easy to find, inexpensive classics that you can, if you like them, you can repeat it for yourself. You can try to impress your friends at your next dinner party. Uh, and the idea again is, if you think a little bit about what's going on, if you think about the body and the acidity in the wine, that with the right cheese pairing, many times those things change for the better. And we had, in that example, we had the Sauvignon Blanc, which seemed to improve uh, after the, the goat cheese. And then you've also got the Chianti, which seems to improve after the, the Parmesan. Or then also sometimes you've got these classic powerful characters that match well together. And there you've got the, uh, the Chardonnay with either the Gruyere or the Cheddar, or the one we just finished with, the Port with this really kind of strong, uh, uh, strong salty Stilton, okay? And also the dark chocolate. And I think that is, ah, and then the special offer. Okay, so uh, the quick story is, so we've been, uh, so uncorked, our business uncorked, so we've been hosting people, hosting events for three or four years now. And our big development in our business is that we have spent the last year and a half working very hard on an e-commerce version of our business. So the problem was we were getting a lot of requests and we couldn't fill them all. And then we decided that, hey, this actually isn't so difficult. What people just need is a little bit of help. So almost just like we gave you here, you just need to be told, you know, which wine and which cheese are supposed to go together and, 
and you can have this experience for yourself. So actually in two we uh, less than two weeks, September 30th, we're launching this new online business, which is called Sipster. So sipster.seha. And it is um, themed wine tasting parties that you can host for yourself at home or if you have an office apero. So the idea is if you have a birthday party coming up or uh, the girls have a, a bachelorette or a Hindu evening or you've got a baby shower or a wedding shower or for some reason you want to celebrate, that uh, from anywhere from four to 40 people, we will send you everything you need, the wines and uh, the recipes. We don't ship the food, but we'll tell you what kind of food either to buy, like the cheeses or recipes if you want to cook, uh, what to make. And then we include also how-tos, so how to throw a party. It's not always um, obvious, so really a list of what you need to do. And then finally, we make a little uh, tasting game as well. So I didn't mention it on your, uh, um, oh did we not hand out the tasting sheets? Oh my goodness. Okay, we need to do that. You were supposed to have a tasting sheet, which we should hand out right now. Okay. Uh, with a list of this. So if you're taking notes, then hopefully you remember it even better. But um, in my bag right there, there's, we'll give you, we'll give you uh, a takeaway. And then, um, yeah, so essentially we give you uh, materials that you can also make uh, your own kind of tasting game, something to play along with, no wine necessary knowledge. So our... Uh, and thank you for attending, and hopefully you enjoyed that and learned a little something that you may repeat again in the future. And we can take any other questions, but I think we're getting close to the end of the day. So. <laughs> They do, they do as well. They have a very nice culture as well. And they have a really one of the best cheddars on the planet. I have to go. Cheddar is amazing. At uh, the event. It's the British Cheese Center. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Their cheddar is outstanding and it's kind of still in the short Yeah, good point. Yeah, but I like to work in wine station and I'm looking for it. I'm really excited.
Back again? Yeah. Everyone's 